13 years ago, I attempted to get into Egypt with a film crew to go down to the Red Sea crossing site at Nueva. I was shut down, I was turned away, there was no way that they were going to let me into uh, that, that parcel of ground down there. And so I then went up to a, a lot and attempted to hire a boat to get me in the back way. And again, I was shut down. To get over to Mount Sinai, I had schemed for years of how to be able to do this. I know that Wyatt got in there, I know Jim and Penny got in there, but I was unable to do that because there is a lot of danger involved and this thing is so heavily guarded out there. But yet this year, Joe Richardson was able to get to Mount Sinai and knowing the dangers, he went through the uh, and, and well, whatever was necessary to get the clearance and then the excitement didn't stop there. Joel, take us to Mount Sinai. We wanna hear about your adventure. Sure, yeah, and for clarity, um, I did it legally. I got in legally, I got you know the correct uh, letter of invitation and so mm -hmm. forth, and um, so it was all on the up and up, but um, nevertheless. But, <laughs> yeah, the, the adventure didn't stop there with the permit, huh? Yeah, so in terms of, um, we flew into Tobuk. So Tobuk is the major largest city that's pretty close to Mount Sinai. It's about two and a half, three hours drive from the airport uh, to the location of Mount Sinai. Now, what we have been told, because there are different people that have gone up there and visited it um, even recently, is that even to this day, the Saudis have essentially deputized the local Bedouins to arrest people who are trespassing. Um, some days the Bedouins say, quace, quace, no problem, it's good. You can, you know, have free range. Other days they'll harass you and arrest you. So it's just, it's touch and go. You don't know what you're gonna get. So as a result of that, um, I, I didn't want to go there and get arrested the first day. You know, I wanted to see the mountains. So w the way we arranged it is we flew into Dubuque late and then we drove all night. So the plan was we were gonna get there on Friday, which is the day of prayer. So most, mo most people would be at mosque, at masjid. They wouldn't be, you know, out and about. We thought it would be a, a, a ideal day to start. But what we thought we would do is get there an hour or two before they got up for that earliest fajr, that's the, the time of prayer, before the sun rises or sort of right at sunrise. That's at about 4.30. So we drove all night. Um, I've got a little video here. You can kind of see, you know, this is dirt road. You're talking way out in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And we're doing our best with real limited GPS, you know, trying to find the right road. And essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna go up the Central Valley. This is on the eastern side of the mountain. Find a little quiet spot. Again, avoid the Bedouin police station. We're driving past all these little Bedouin camps and so forth. And we did drive right by the, the main police station there, which these are just these block structures, right? And um, see, that was about two o'clock in the morning. And we're trying to find this little dirt road off of the dirt road that we were already on. Um, it's not easy, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's <laughs> a difficult. dirt road off the dirt road in yeah. the middle of the desert. A path, yeah. you know, so we had rented a couple, um, had a couple uh, Toyota, uh, I guess land cruisers or something. We were gonna camp for a couple hours, in other words, get a power nap, sleep for about two hours, get up at sunrise and start hiking. So it was, you know, in other words, we were gonna be up all night and then hike all day. So that was gonna be taxing in of, so kind of get a couple hours. We basically overshot the path that we were trying to find. So we were essentially one valley over. So what that meant was that when we got up at sunrise, we thought, here's the mountain. This is the way mountains are. You look up, you say, here's the mountain. We hike up the mountain, takes us about an hour. We get to the top of the mountain and we go, oh, we have to go down the mountain and then up again. Okay, so we were on, we went one mountain too far. So that killed some of our water, some of our energy, some of our time. That was kind of a, you know. Now, I have to ask you, the, this, uh, this other trail you were looking for, were you trying to find this by GPS? How did you know what to look for? Yeah, we had breadcrumbs, we had GPS breadcrumbs. And again, you know, what's, so, what's such a blessing is the Caldwells. 
way back when in the 90s, they made 14 visits there. They have explored that mountain more than just about anyone. And they yeah. had laid all of these GPS coordinates. And then different people who work for Ramco and, and in country, they have then taken these sacred coordinates and they've used them as guide as because there's been you know, a dozen or more people that have gone over the years and they've done so quietly. They wanted to mm -hmm. see it for themselves. But now you have almost like a whole little community there that has all the coordinates and they've really expanded upon it. So they know where everything is. The oh, problem that, that's beautiful. So they laid the foundation and now you've got you know, you, another generation that yeah. has gone in there yeah. on those same uh, coordinates. Yeah, yeah. I, I liken myself to um, the way that Paul describes it. He says, and, you know, because all these other folks have gone, and here it is, 2018, and last of all, as to one <laughs> untimely born, you know, I came along, Johnny come lately, I had the chance to see it, but it's just, it's just a blessing to sort of stand on the shoulders of all of those that have gone before. But here's what's amazing, is although much of it has been explored, there is so much yet to be explored. So yeah. when we, we came up over this mountain, we came down, now we're in the Central Valley that we had intended to camp at, and, um, I've got a picture here at the beginning. So this this sort of dark path cutting in at the bottom, this is the valley that we then came across. So after we came down this first mountain, this is what we were looking ah, at. So this is uh, really li li like a wadi undercutting uh, the, the base of the mountain there. Yep. Right? Uh, yeah, and this valley basically shoots out from the east. So if you okay. were to looking at that, that shoots out of the mountain from the east. The top of the mountain there that's all dark, it's a dark basalt rock, that is Mount Sinai. That's right. Mount Sinai, mm -hmm. again, about 8,000 uh, feet tall. So as we got just to the other side of that wadi that's all of the dark rock, mm -hmm. just as we got to the other side of that to the lighter granite, and this is what I want to tell you about, is dumb old Joel just stumbling his way through. He comes up to these rocks, and there's sort of these higher little mounds of rocks, we'll say. And as I look, I see these, they're not caves, but just sort of the underside of these rocks. I see all of these paintings. I say, hey, guys, you know, there's some people are... 150 yards up ahead, hey, I found some paintings. Okay. And I had assumed that the Caldwells or someone had already taken pictures of it because they have thousands of pictures, thousands. So I start taking pictures of all of these. I'll show you a picture of it. And so here's the, the, These are pictures that they never had. And yeah. uh, th these are the first ones, ladies and gentlemen, to pay close attention because this is the first time anyone is seeing these uh, in, in real life. And uh, and this this is incredible evidence right here. Yeah, and you know what's interesting as well, as I'll just throw this out, is at little pockets around the mountain, I had cell service. So I was texting the Caldwells and Penny's texting back going, oh my gosh, you know, because we're doing live back and forth. And she said, I've never seen these. We've never seen these. We've yeah. never seen pictures of these. So we find um, these paintings of archers. Now these are not right. petroglyphs. They're not chiseled. These are painted with some type of ochre paint or something. And because they're on the underside of the rocks, they were preserved from the weather, protected from the weather. Right. And what do you see is you see archers. Clearly these are archers. Um, archers launching arrows. Archers Good launching bows. arrows. Here's another picture. Is This is just, looks like a picture of an arrow. I don't know if there was an archer that uh, got a little bit weathered. Here's another picture of some more. They're not hunting animals. This is what's interesting. You just see right. all these pictures of people shooting arrows. And there was probably 30 of them. Okay, I've just shown you a few pictures here. So... I texted my wife. I said, hey, check it out. Because initially I'm just thinking, well, these are probably just paintings of people hunting. But then I'm looking, I'm going, but there's no animals. They're just a whole bunch of people shooting arrows. I text my wife and she says, oh, that's exactly like Isaiah 19. I'm, I'm sorry, that's just like uh, Exodus 19. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I said, Exodus 19, I'm not familiar even with what, what you're talking about. And she goes, yeah. <laughs> she, and so she quotes me the verse. Well, it says, the Lord says to Moses, he says, Moses, Go consecrate the people. On the third day, I'm about to come down on the mountain. He says, but put up boundaries all around the base of the mountain. 
And he says, and this is to let them know not to step foot on the mountain. If they do, they are to either be stoned to death or shot through with arrows. And ladies and gentlemen, here you're seeing it. This is the boundary around the base of Mount Sinai. And on that boundary, we have these images that were put there by Moses, the children of Israel, saying, if you go past this, you are, uh, uh, by commandment of Almighty God, you are to be shot through with arrows. If an animal goes up on this, then you shoot it through with arrows. Nobody touches this mountain. Right. Yeah, these th- are- th- this is it. This is the real thing. It's like the ancient no trespassing sign. You know, <laughs> uh, trespassers will be shot on sight. <laughs> this is beautiful. And then that, that, that morning, that, you know, three days later, uh, when, when the, 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 like the furnace from heaven comes down on that, on that mountain and trumpets began blowing, nobody is on that mountain. There, there's nobody there. No one's been able to touch that mountain or go up on it. The Almighty who says, you know, this is sanctified and trumpets began blowing on that mountain that were so loud that rocks broke. Yeah. You know, that, that is sound pressure that is beyond the, uh, the threshold of pain right there. But, and then that's when the people were gathered at the base of that mountain to hear the voice of Almighty God shout down his commandments. This is the place that it happened, ladies and gentlemen. This is it. Yeah. Wow, this is, this is great. This is, the, this is the spot of the single greatest theophany, the greatest appearing of God in all of human history. You know, for Christians, we're aware of it. Christians are aware of the story. Again, they've seen the Cecil B. DeMille, you know, they've kind of seen the movies and so forth, Charlton Heston and, you know, but but it's almost a little bit like a Sunday school class. It's yeah, almost like it's a fairy almost tale. flannel graph. I mean, what Cecil B. DeMille did compared to what really was there. The people were afraid they were going to die. This was this was so intense. They pled with Moses, please, you go up and speak to the Almighty. We are afraid we're going to die. Right. Yeah. You know, th- th- this is this is absolutely incredible. The fire of God, the smoke of God, the cloud, the earthquake, the the trumpets, all of these things, and the voice of God, and they're begging, please. You know, this is the thing, you could have followed Yeshua around during his ministry. It actually says that even after he rose from the dead, he says, hey, go up to Galilee and meet me on the mountain, and it actually says, some of them doubted. Like, can you imagine, you're standing there in the presence of the glorified, resurrected Son of God, Yeshua, and there was still doubt, but I guarantee you, there was none of the Israelites sitting at the base of the mountain. Oh, they the, were not the, doubting. The, this is it, Joel, because uh, the Yehovah uh, told Moses, on that day, I'm going to do something that from then on, no one will ever doubt your word again. Right. And, and this was such an incredible, uh, yeah, yeah, just an incredible revelation that Israel, it wasn't just a small group, all of, of Israel, all of the uh, of the nations that, that came out, the mixed multitude, they were there, right there to hear the voice of God and no trespassing. No trespassing. Was, and I guarantee you. Shot on sight. Yeah, exactly. I, and I guarantee you there was many more of these. It's just that because these were on sort of the underside of the rocks, they were preserved. I guarantee you there was oh. many, many more. But yeah. mm-hmm. the, the paintings over the thousands of years, of course, wear it off. And that's the thing is, you know, it's not a crazy thing to say there is the possibility that Moses himself painted these. That's, yeah. that's, that's yeah. not an impossibility. Right. So it's just one more confirmation. It's just one more confirmation that this is indeed the correct mountain. From there, we began making our way up to the cave that we believe is the cave that Elijah visited when he went to Mount Sinai. So this, again, I'm not even okay. sure who found it. Who was the first one to find it? Did, did Ron Wyatt find it? I, uh, no, I, I, I do not know that. I just know that, uh, that Jim Caldwell took the photographs from inside the cave looking down uh, on the, uh, the older golden calf and the other uh, uh, artifacts that were there. Sure. So, 
So we made our way up there. Now, what we had was we did have a GPS unit. Okay, um, now, now this, uh, again, even up to Elijah's cave, that's going to take us a while, is it not? It took us a total of six hours to get up there. Okay. Now, that's right. kind of a bad testament to us, but essentially, this GPS told us that we were real close. What it didn't tell us is that we were 500 meters uh, sort of, you know, longitude, latitude, but we had to go up the mountain. So we kept circling around the mountain and we were perpetually 500 meters away. Well, 500 meters away, an hour later, it was 500 meters away. Finally, we looked up and saw it. So uh, once we got yeah. to the eastern side, we looked up and there it is. And it's a very prominent cave. So looking up, here's a picture of it. I've blacked out a couple of uh, my friend's face. So you can see it. It's a pretty decent sized cave. Mm -hmm. And you can see it again, it's facing east. It's facing east, and then I've got another shot here from the inside. Um, and it's the cave is about 20 feet deep. So when you read the account, um, Eli, the biblical account, Elijah goes and he stays in the cave, and the, the floor right. of the cave is smooth, smooth sand. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a little bit sloped, but you can easily see how someone could stay and spend the night and spend some time in the cave. You could easily take a nap, but it's still a pretty good um, hike up there. You can see how high we are there. And uh, do we not see uh, down there, uh, off to in the distance and to the right, the altar of the golden calf? Yeah, so right in front of you as you're sitting there, and in fact, I sat down there in the mouth of the cave. You can see a person here down sitting down. I sat down there and I recorded a little 15 minute update put it on YouTube. I said, hey guys, we're here in front of Elijah's cave on Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia. And right behind me, you can see the the altar that we believe is the golden calf altar. And then as yeah, you said- You're gonna take us there, right? We're gonna go there. Okay. Um, and then as you look down, you're essentially looking right down on top of another altar that we believe is mm -hmm. the earthen altar that Moses made out of uh, natural, it's uncut stone. And this is where he would have been sacrificing animals, right at the base of the mountain, exactly as the scriptures describe. And it also is right next to a stream that Deuteronomy tells us comes down the mountain. We'll talk about that some more. But you're looking right down at it, again, into that eastern valley. And there's also now a bunch of Bedouin structures and gardens, and there's a road that comes through there. I think the Saudis are about to turn that into a major road. Mm. Right now, it's you're talking out in the boondocks. You're talking way out in the middle of nowhere. Once they put in a major road, um, I, by faith, I believe that road is going to become like Jerusalem and there's gonna be all kinds of tour buses. There's gonna be all kinds of tour buses coming soon. And so, you know, we again, we appeal to the Saudi authorities. We say, preserve this sacred historical site of heritage. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's about to happen. Yeah, so, well, I, I congratulate the Saudis on preserving the mountain of Moses, preserving the altar to the golden calf, preserving these different things so that the rocks literally can cry out, and, and uh, for preserving the, uh, uh, the, the paintings of yeah. the uh, no trespassing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So from there, we, we said, okay, we're gonna go ahead. Um, we were, it was six hours, we were almost out of water, and we said we were gonna hike to the top of the mountain, we said forget about it. One of the guys had twisted his ankle, we looked down at the altar of Moses' altar, and we said let's hike down to there, let's go check that out. So that was mm -hmm. sort of the next step in our journey, and I think in the next segment we'll come back and uh, talk about that. During these two minutes, while you are busy donating to keep this message going out around the world, Joel showed me, leafed through hundreds and hundreds of pictures that he has that we can't even get out right now. But we are going to have Joel here for a few episodes to take us to Mount Sinai and to show you some of the treasures. But I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen, there are so many things that are going to be coming out in the future. Joel, tell us about what you found at Mount Sinai. All right. So again, we just, we ended, we talked about Elijah's cave. And, you know, I just, I always love to emphasize, I go, look, if this is Mount Sinai, it must have a prominent cave on it. It has the cave. Skeptics say coincidence. I go, okay, 
Maybe you can say it's a coincidence. You're skeptical. I give you the freedom to be a skeptic. Well, we've also got archers around the base of the mountain. They say, coincidence. I go, okay, you're free to be a skeptic. Well, <laughs> then we look down. We've got an, an earthen altar at the base. That's exactly as the scriptures describe. The Lord told Moses to build an altar at the base of the mountain. Well, that's a coincidence. At what point, when you have a dozen coincidences, are you becoming irrational? Right? You know, even right. the skeptic, you have to be skeptical of skepticism itself. At a certain point, it just becomes foolish. So we look down from Elijah's cave. We're looking down at this structure. So from up above, it looks like it's kind of like a hockey stick shaped curve, you know, mm. uh, it's 45 degree angle. And there's a line down the middle. So it's, it's very clear. So we decided, let's just go down there. Now, from Elijah's cave, it looks like it's just going to take you 10 minutes to get down. Well, you hike down for 10 minutes, and you don't look like you've even gone anywhere. It's still way down there. You hike down another 20 minutes, it's still way down there. It probably took us an hour just to get down from Elijah's cave down to Moses' altar. It's a, again, it's a big mountain. You're up there, even just to get to Elijah's cave, it's quite a hike. So we get down there, I'll show you a picture. I don't have one of the pictures from up above, um, although I did have a, a camera that I got some shots from above. I couldn't find the uh, couldn't find the clips here. But so here's a picture mm. as you get down. Now what you're looking at right here is it's these two long corridors. So you've got a, a stone wall on either side. Now it's important to say when the Lord told Moses to make this altar, He says use uncut stones. Mm -hmm. Well, again, these are uncut stones. These are natural stacked stones, and they're still there to this day. And the Saudi government, the archaeological authorities, about a decade ago, they excavated and investigated this area. This is what's so amazing is, again, you know, and I've emphasized this, you go to Israel, you go, well, this is the place where Paul, you know, ministered. This is the place where Yeshua did some miracles. And it's, it's powerful. It's powerful for anybody who has not been to Israel. You go there the first time. It's a powerful spiritual experience. But for the most part, everything's 30 feet underground. Right. And what we have are church traditions there. We don't have the actual spot where Jesus had his first falafel sandwich at the Church of the Holy Pita. You know, this is this is the kind of stuff that goes on there. They will actually move archaeological sites, so to speak, because they know they can't get any buses to that area. And so they'll move it to another area so that they can uh, build a gift shop for there. But here... There's no reason to build a gift shop out here. Here we have the real thing. Here, again, in the sovereignty of God, he has preserved and protected. And you walk out in the desert, and here is this, here's this site that's still sitting there, almost as if it was left by Moses a few years ago. That's what's so amazing That's about right. it. That's right. Now, now, what this this picture that everyone's seeing here, um, in, in the interview that I did with Jim and Penny, they had this shot from up above where right. you can uh, better see the corral. You're right down on ground level where yeah. this took place. These are the corrals uh, in order to herd the the bulls as far as uh, uh, to, to the altar there. And, and this is very important in the very opening uh, chapters this is chapter 20 uh, through 23 of Exodus, right here that this, uh, this very altar was built for this. Right, and so essentially, yeah, because this is not a living, this is not a living structure. This is not, this is not a home, you know, so you go, well, what is it? It's these two very long corridors that turn at an angle. Mm -hmm. And so, as you said, it would have been perfect for herding animals. And of course, you don't want the animals to look ahead and go, oh, this is what's about to happen to me. <laughs> right. So they, yeah. they turn at an angle. So as they're getting slaughtered up ahead, they don't know what's going on until they... You know, the th th it's very insightful because uh, I, I took a tour of Iowa Beef, which is a slaughterhouse, a major slaughterhouse, and they do the same thing, that same turn that Moses built out there in the desert so that they, the, the, uh, the animals don't see what's about to go down. Right. And so this thing, it's like 100 feet long. Okay, so I mean, it's a, this is a big structure. And then at the end is where the, the actual sacrifices would have taken place. Now, here's what's interesting. So the Saudi archeological you know, committee, 
commissioned a, an investigation of the site, uh, again, maybe a decade or so ago. And I have the survey. It's called Albid, um, which is after Albad. That's the, uh, the, the town nearby. And what they found, again, this is not, these are not Christians trying to prove anything. In fact, they were probably maybe trying to, I won't say they were trying to disprove it, but they were not excited to prove it because they didn't mm-hmm. want all these people pouring in a decade ago. That was not on their, uh, on their plans. And they found organic matter, bones, ashes, and, and uh, fecal matter, you know, and so forth. This was a place where animals were kept. This is a place where animals were sacrificed. They found exactly what you would expect to find if indeed this was the place of, of animal sacrifice, animals being burnt and so forth, this mm-hmm. is, ex- it's, it's verified again. Um, so again, coincidence. Hey, we, we, we got to stop here right now because this, this takes us back to Passover this year. Uh, you were, you were our, our, our guest at, at Passover this year and, uh, and, and really the, the teaching, which, uh, uh, you know, we, we wanted to rename it, uh, Yeshua's threshing tour, uh, be, because of you really replaying or Playing ahead of time, what it's going to look like when Yeshua returns, because it's a much bigger picture than any anyone in, in the Christian world has ever seen, and and it was absolutely brilliant. I actually watched it again with my wife this last weekend. Very inspiring, but. I have to say that, that that Passover, this is what we went through this and what happened at this place. That after the 10th command was shouted down, that's when the people said, Moses, you know, we don't want to hear the voice of Almighty God. We are afraid we're going to die. And so Moses then takes the words of the people up to, up the mountain and Yehovah says they have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will not speak to them in, in, in a flame of fire in this firing mountain and, and with my voice shaking the earth again. But they are required to hear and obey everything that you say. And then he said, I'm going to send another prophet in the future one who is like Moses, to, that, that, that I know face to face, that hears my voice, and he, the people, must shema. They must hear and obey. And so this is the first messianic, the, the messianic prophecy of all scripture. That is it. It's recorded in Deuteronomy 18. But this is when Moses comes down from the mountain. He's given more information. The first piece of information that he is given is build, when you build an altar, do it of unhewn stones. That's the first one. And then you're to keep a feast to me three times a year. He goes on with the, with, with those commandments, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, you know, releasing the, the slaves after they've served their time and all. And then finally, Moses it, uh, comes down. He writes all those words on a scroll. That's when they do the uh, the uh, sacrifice of the animals. The blood is then taken, put in basins, and he sprinkles it on the people, on the scroll, and on the altar that is still there. Mm-hmm. That that the Saudis recognize that it has the remains of, of 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 animals there, and then he says this is the blood covenant. Mm -hmm. This is the blood covenant. Whoever breaks the covenant is dead. If I break the covenant with my people, I will die. If Israel breaks their covenant with me, they die. And and there you 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 take us right to that very place. You're at ground level where those animals were herded in, ground level where that altar was when the blood was sprinkled on that very altar. Yeah, it's absolutely astounding. So right there at the spot, you've got the altar. And then the other part that's in the text is he says, and Moses, and this is right in, right next to where he tells him to build the altar. And he says, and set up 12 pillars after the 12 tribes of Israel. And so as you step away, yeah, there, there. here's a wow. picture. You step away from the altar. You can see the altar right behind us. Right there on the ground, there are several, the, the remains of pillars and we were standing on the promises of God, so to speak. I blacked out some of my friends' faces, but I mean, 
once again, another coincidence? You know, you have exactly what the scriptures describe sitting right there. And again, some of the skeptics say, well, the, this just means standing stone. The Israelites would not have had the sophistication to make these round. They're pretty crude uh, poems. Blah, blah, blah. They just came blah. from Egypt. Yeah, that, that's a, you know, archaeologists, like all scientists, they will lie. They will do anything they have to do to preserve their position. Uh, you got to realize that, that the scripture is true. All men are liars. It just depends on where the money, follow the money, follow the, uh, where, where they've got uh, their seniority and uh, et cetera. But now, now Jim and Penny, you know, in measuring these things, they related to these as the number of the different tribes that, that, that they can be uh, measured and it is in correspondence with the tribes and the number of the tribes of Israel, of these 12 tribes, which is very significant here. Yeah, it's amazing. And they suggest, they suggest that when the scriptures say that Moses was to apply the blood to the people, that what he may have done, because you had such a vast number of people, what he may have done was actually sprinkled it on the pillars as they represented the tribes. I don't know if that's true or not, but if that's the case, here they are, they sit right next to the altar. Um, you know, again, so it's just point after point. The other issue is that right behind the altar, which I, I don't have pictures of, is a river that comes down the mountain. And this is specifically mentioned in Deuteronomy that there's a river, a stream that flows down the mountain. There it is on the same spot. If Moses was sacrificing all of these animals, he would have needed some water. Right. And then yeah. you have the very interesting thing, and we'll get into it because probably about uh, 300 yards from here is the location of what we believe was the golden calf altar where the, the, the greatest catastrophe happened. I mean, this was the worst thing since Noah's flood in terms of, you know, just rebellion. Right. Yeah. And what happens after they rebelled and they had this, they worshiped this golden idol of a, of a cow is that Moses is in, he's furious he comes down and he grind, he burns the he burns the idol so it was probably a wooden idol covered with 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 gold he burns it and he puts the the ashes into the water that's their water right. source and, and literally grinds the golden calf grinds the gold into dust yeah. and makes us drink it makes them drink it and i love this because because the God of the Bible is the God of object lessons. He loves visuals. He's really about embedding memories into our minds. He knows we learn verbally and orally and visually and all these, and he loves, he loves, I'll call it the liturgy, you know? Mm -hmm. That's why he is a very liturgical God. So he grinds up the idol, he puts it in the water, he makes the rebels drink it, and the object lesson is that when all is said and done, the only thing left of this God that they were just bowing before, just hours before, is now reduced to human waste on the ground. And you can hear Yahweh saying, where are your gods now? Where are your gods now? Is this the one that led you up out of Egypt? You just stepped in one of your gods, the remains of your gods. Yeah, and this is, I mean, you know, and I'm quoting, of course, Deuteronomy 32. Because mm -hmm. Moses says, he says, listen, he says to the Jews, he goes, guys, to the Israelites, he says, listen, when I was with you, you guys followed after idols. After I leave, you're going to do it again. And he goes, because you provoked, the Lord says, because you provoked me to anger, here's what I'm going to do through the lips of a foolish people. I'm a Gentile, foolish people right here. Through the lips of a foolish people, God is going to provoke them to anger by calling them to repent. And yeah. so this is what he says, he goes, and then in the latter days, the Ahrit Hayamim, in the, the latter days, he says, when your strength has run out, then I'm gonna say to you, where are your gods now? And so there's a yeah. larger prophetic picture. Oh yeah, yeah. This is this is Joel. You know, the, the Joel's uh, the in, invading army. You know, all mixes into this. Well, you know, we 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 can't uh, uh, let this thing go by. You know, we we while we're there, right there at the at the altar, 
you know, this is where, uh, you know, when Moses put us under the blood covenant, and I, I you know, I, I like to picture it where he is taking all day long and shaking the blood on all the people, uh, you know, which is, you know, standing out in the hot sun uh, in the third month, third biblical month. I mean, th- this is a, uh, uh, this is a real object lesson. This is no Catholic holy water. Oh, right, right, <laughs> right. It takes branches of hyssop and it takes all day long and gallons of blood uh, from all these uh, 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 oxen that, that were sacrificed here. But and now Moses goes back over the mountain and he fasts for 40 days and 40 nights because he is told that he's gonna be given tables of stone. And so this, this, this of, of course, uh, uh, preempts uh, Cecil B. DeMille's version. I mean, you know, this is, he didn't have 40 days and 40 nights to complete the movie, okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, so he has to do the short version, but then the Almighty, in six verses, reiterates the sanctity of the Sabbath, then gives him the tables of stone. Moses goes down to the mountain where we have, and we're gonna show him, the, the altar of the golden calf there, and, and Aaron said, Tomorrow is a feast to Yehovah. And, and, and one of the, uh, the commandments Moses wrote on that scroll when he came down from the mountain is you will not name the name of other gods. You will have no other gods in my face, the very first commandment. And so the Almighty said to Moses, stand back, Moses, I'm going to kill them all. Right now, I'm gonna kill them all, and I'm gonna start over with you, and I'm gonna make you a great nation. And Moses, Moses refused. He went back up to the mountain for another 40 days without food or water, bringing himself to the point of death to, to intercede for the people, and then that's when the Almighty said, okay, build a, a, an altar of bronze, and you're gonna remember this day, you're gonna remember that you owe the death penalty forever because every feast, every feast, you're gonna sacrifice bulls and goats and lambs and rams because that's gonna remind you, you owe the death penalty and until the death penalty is paid. So th- this whole thing right here, this is this is the gospel. This is what Yeshua, uh, what, what he accomplished for us in paying the death penalty. And it's right here illustrated at that mountain. I can't wait. You know, uh, <laughs> I can't wait to get to this mountain Amen. in one of those buses and yeah. tell the story. Yeah. I can't wait. Yeah, and it's going to happen, man, by faith. Again, it, I, within a couple of years, we'll, we'll, we'll be there. Yeah, no, I mean, this is, this is the, 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 the foundation. This is the genesis, this is the birth of biblical religion. You know, if, if you will, God, God revealing his truth to not just to the Israelites, but to all people that we're guilty, yeah. we're guilty and we deserve that, the death penalty. That, that, that's right, that's right. It's like Israel is the uh, is a microcosm for uh, the, the death penalty that we all earned under under Adam. Adam's transgression by uh, death and sin entered and uh, death entered into the world through Adam's transgression and we are all under that death penalty. All of sin right. and come short of the glory of God. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, and it's easy sometimes for Gentiles to to criticize Israel. They go, man, you know, God just appeared to you on the mountain, and then here you are immediately worshiping a golden calf. Wow, you guys are particularly unfaithful. No, Israel's story is a long history. First, they commit themselves zealously, then they fail to commit to complete and live up to their commitments. Then the Lord ultimately is long-suffering, patient, merciful. He forgives them, he restores them. In other words, their story is just like my personal story, your personal story, everyone out there. We need God's new mercy every morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, uh, this is the old, old story that really just isn't told enough. And, and uh, to understand the gospel, this is what I've been teaching for now decades, mm. is that we cannot understand the gospels until we understand the Torah. Right. And, and then when we've got the foundation, when we've got, when we've learned from the schoolmaster that is supposed to bring us to Messiah, 
then once we, we have arrived, it's like, okay, now the small print, the fine print is, it's like, okay, we make him Lord, what do you want me to do? Because the fine print is written on our hearts. It's, it's by the Spirit, what does he want me to do? You, you paid a, a price to get over there. You, you, you know, and we're not gonna go into the, the price that you paid, what your family uh, paid and in, in the, the strife and the trouble, but see, you know, sometimes if we knew how difficult the road would be, we would have said, no thank you. But you said at one time, you are Lord, and whatever you tell me to do, and he, he's the one that put on the desire of your heart to get to Mount Sinai. Yeah, there's something big going on. There's something big. Again, the stories that you're talking about, the stories that we're talking about, this foundational stuff, the Lord is about to remind the whole world about this stuff again. He's going to call, he's not just calling their attention to this mountain, it's not just an archeological site, he's calling people back to the story. Because right. the whole Torah, after this happens, he repeatedly states, why do you do this, why do you do this each year? So that you'll remember. Remember, And he is going to make sure that everyone remembers before the return of Yeshua, he's about to remind everyone afresh. He's yeah. gonna tell the story again. Amen. Now, Joel, that's why I have uh, in my lobby all of the uh, life-size articles of the, the tabernacle because I love to tell the story. And, and the this, this story of what Yeshua did for us is in that tabernacle. And uh, to, to be able to take you, ladies and gentlemen, to Mount Sinai because of what Joel has done, this is one of the greatest treasures in life. Uh, the, the story continues. We're gonna be back next week. I'd like to close in prayer. Yehovah bless you and keep you. Yehovah make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Yehovah lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of Yeshua, the Prince of Peace, our Lord, our Master, our Savior, who will save us from the wrath to come. Amen, amen. Shavuot, have a good week, people. We'll see you next week. Shabbat night live.